Yeah, yeah, of course, uh, much of the kind of self-mythology of capitalism is that competition is something that uh, the capitalists celebrate and the capitalists really, really fight for, really fight for competition. And in some senses, in some senses, that's true. They fight for competition when, when they, when the capitalists themselves are prevented from certain markets that they, that they, they fight to go in. So there is this coercive competition among, among capitalists. But capitalism itself actually depends on the elimination of competition. Because if you have the mythical idealized free market of, of, of capitalism, then uh, according to, according to, um, according to capitalist economics, the, uh, Competition will drive the price of things down to the cost of production, right? Because if, if, if you really had limitless, limitless competition in a given, in a, in a, for a given commodity, for producing a given commodity, then the price of that commodity would be reduced to its, to its cost of production, right? And if it's reduced to its cost of production, that means that there's nothing left to accumulate. If there's nothing left to accumulate, that means that capital can't reproduce itself and you can't have a capital, and you can't have a capital class and a capitalist, um, you can't have a capitalist system and a capitalist class. So for capitalism to exist, it depends on the elimination of competition to a certain degree for capital to accumulate. Well, no, where capitalism definitely wants competition is among, among workers, right? Competition, competition among, uh, in the labor market is definitely very important to capitalism because, because that, helps, that helps them keep wages down to their own level of reproduction cost, their own level of subsistence, right? So by having an intensely competitive labor market, Capital, capital is able to extract more surplus value, more, more profits from, from, the work, from, the, from the work of workers. But where, where they don't want competition is in the circulation of commodities, where they need, they, they need to protect their markets in order, to actually, in order to actually gain surpluses. Some of the work of telecommunist and especially Thimble, uh, uh, we, 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 we created this concept of the, of the economic fiction or social fiction to describe, to describe the work. So there's a common, there's a common kind of uh, line of argument in net culture, uh, especially the Free Software Foundation, Evan Moglin makes this line of argument quite, quite commonly. And this, and, this, and, and this starts with this idea that we have, that we have uh, centralized social media now and Facebook and Twitter and so forth. And because of projects like Freedom Box and Diaspora, we're moving from a centralized um, social media platform to a decentralized social media platform. And of course, this, this, uh, this argument um, is, is fundamentally historically incorrect because actually the internet itself is a distributed social media platform. From the earliest days, we could, we could share, we could put status updates, we could post pictures, we could have discussions, we could do citizen journalism, we could share software. Those features were part of the internet from the earliest days. So we haven't, we haven't gone from centralized to decentralized, we've gone from decentralized to centralized. And the reason for that is because communication platforms are built by the profit motive. And because the profit motive requires the capture of user data and user interaction in order to turn it into money, in order to make, in order to make money from communication platforms, the centralization is required because you need centralization to charge fees, to collect data that you can sell, to push advertisements. All of these things require a centralized, a centralized infrastructure, right? So, Edwin Moglin's proposal and other people, he's not the only one, that's, that it's just simply a matter of writing distributed tools and then people will stop using Facebook is, is, uh, is incorrect. And so to demonstrate this, to kind of artistically approach this, uh, we created this idea of economic fictions and Thimble in particular. So Thimble was um, an artwork from 2010 and we created a microblogging platform like Twitter, uh, but it was completely decentralized and the reason it was completely decentralized is because it used a uh, protocol from the 1970s called Finger. So it's a protocol that's literally been in existence since the 1970s that actually was the original way that status updates were done in the early, in the early internet. So the point of this is that the technological problem is actually rather simple. Right? In fact, the technological problem has been solved many, many, many times. The reason that we have Twitter and not Thimble is not because nobody's thought of a way to distribute status updates. The reason is that nobody will finance them. So playing off the idea of science fiction. So science, in science fiction, you have people inventing technologies that 
could perhaps come to exist decades later when the limitations of science are transcended. So that's why they're science fictions. It's not that they're not possible, it's that, it's that they're fictions at this stage because for them to become reality, science has to transcend its current limitations. So that's why we call these economic fictions or social fictions because, because for platforms like this to exist, it, they're not science fictions, they work. Like Thimble actually works as a platform, it's functional. The, but the point, the point is that it's not a technological fiction, it's a social or economic fiction because for it to exist, society has to transform, economics has to transform to such a thing where we can fund communication platforms from something other than the profit motive, something that, something that is driven by you know, for benefit or use value uh, uh, logic. The question is not just finding financing, it's finding sufficient financing, right? Like you can certainly find financing, but that's the point, is that you'd find just enough financing to make an obscure niche that may still be very useful because it may serve a certain community in a particular way that the mainstream platforms don't. So like these kinds of alternative platforms are still very important, both, uh, both for development of ideas and also for actual use by communities that may be small and have different interests in the mainstream. But they're not going to replace the mainstream unless they have not just financing but sufficient financing and sufficient financing includes user support, marketing, education, enough to actually get people to, to start using it. And so yeah, as an activist or an artist, you're always faced with these choices. I mean, it took us a long time to decide whether or not the tele telecom industry should have a Facebook page, right? Because it was like, you know, well, we've been criticizing Facebook for a long time, but at the same time, not having a Facebook page just takes just just takes our position out of the dialogue for all those people so in the end so in the end we created a facebook page and that facebook page now has like you know 3000 and some odd 3000 some odd likes and uh gets uh probably more views than our main website right so the fact is is that we have to communicate uh, on the mediums that people are using, not on the mediums that we wish they would use. Right? In order to actually in engage with them critically, we have to use the mediums they are using. Right? Because if we want them to use different mediums, then we have to reach them where they are and communicate these things. And we also can't be delusional. We can't, we, we can't imagine that this is just simply a choice, that people have a choice. They can use Facebook or they can use something else. It's not true because those choices are available to certain people that have the, that have the social, educational, technical skills uh, to use these other platforms. But for the vast majority of people, um, there is no choice. They can only, they can only really use the, the mainstream platforms because they're the only ones that have the sufficient capacity for this kind of user, for the kind of user that, that, that isn't net savvy, isn't tech savvy, isn't information politics savvy. The economist Dallas Smythe uh, wrote about the economics of uh, media. Uh, in the, era, in the era of network television, so long before, long before we had uh, networks of any kind that, are, that were popularly used. And, uh, and he, developed, he developed a language um, that's still very, very relevant. And like, so uh, what, what's, what Smythe made clear is that, again, talking about network television, is that the product of network television was not the program. The program was not their product, right? The product was the audience, the people that watched the program. That was the product. And, that, and, he, and he called that product the audience commodity. And the customer of network television is not the viewer, they're the product. The customer is the advertiser. So the, the, actual, the actual business model of network television is selling the audience to the advertiser. And the, and the word that he had for the advertiser was even uh, scarier than audience commodity. He called them the consciousness industry, right? And, uh, and, and, and by this he meant, by this he meant um, advertising agencies, uh, political lobbies, people that wanted to control your behavior. So essentially, so essentially the business model of network television is a business model of behavioral control. And following the dot-com era, so in the dot-com era, the internet was totally wild. They caught capitalism by surprise. They had no idea this was coming. They had their own online services investment in CompuServe and AOL. They were envisioning a whole different, 
online world. The internet came out of nowhere, and the capitalists responded the way cap the, the only way capitalists can respond by buying everything, and then they owned everything, and they had this and they had this network, but they had no idea how they were going to make a business model based upon peer to peer relations, right? And so they went back to the business model they knew, which was the network television business model. And so this is and, and, and so this is what Facebook is, is the is the internet reimagined through the imagination of network television capitalism, right? So they they, they, they said, yes, this is great. We want to, people to share pictures like they did on Usenet, to make status updates like they did on Finger, exchange messages like you do on email, chat like you do on IRC. They wanted people to do all of that, but instead of, but instead of doing it based on open networks, mesh topologies, free software, they wanted them to do it on centralized platforms like the ones they were building, like CompuServe. So this is, what, this is why I often joke that if you, if, you, if you scratch off the Facebook logo, you'll find the CompuServe logo underneath it because this is exactly the same imagination um, that, uh, that it comes from.